Harold, first, can you tell us uh, what you do and, and where we are? Well, currently we're at the University of Stellenbosch and I'm a lecturer at the University. Primarily, I'm responsible for running a course in interpreting, training interpreters, but also learning them and teaching them interpreting theory. Mm -hmm. So we have a postgraduate diploma in translation and interpreting studies, but there's also a master's in interpreting studies. So my main area and my niche area at the moment is interpreting. Okay, interpreting studies in the South African context. With you absolutely okay. right. With we should explain we're in wonderful installations here. Right? Yes, we're currently in the venue. This is the interpreting venue of the university. It was installed three years ago under my supervision. The course itself started in 2005. At that time, I made use of the municipality offices and their facilities regarding the training of the interpreters. But as from, say, three years ago, uh, the university invested money in equipping this venue. Uh -huh. um, and yeah, for the last three years, we've been making use of this facility. Okay, you're, you're training conference interpreters mainly? Primarily conference interpreters, but there's also um, community interpreters that we mm -hmm. do. Um, you know, part of the training is that the students should do an internship. There's X amount of hours that they must interpret in specific, in different contexts. Um, and in some instances, they need to go and interpret in the hospitals, the Salem Bosch Hospital that's just around the corner. So yes, um, so it's a generic course, so to speak, generic interpreting course. We train conference interpreters as well as liaison or community interpreters, both consecutive and simultaneous interpreting thus. Are there other centers in South Africa doing interpreter training? In the to West, a professional level. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In the Western Cape, yeah. we are the only university that okay. offers a uh, qualification in interpreting. Mm -hmm. So we are the only university in the Western Cape. But further north is the University of Free State. Um, they had started off with an interpreting course that was around about in the mid 1990s. Um, and they, if I remember correctly, they are the university in South Africa that has the longest history okay. of the training interpreters. But in the Western Cape, University of Stellenbosch is the only university that offers this course. How about, how about the demand in South Africa for trained interpreters? Is there a market for your graduates? There's a market for interpreters, yes, mm. but money is always a problem. Mm -hmm. Um, if I talk about the Western Cape, for instance, in 2003, the language policy was uh, accepted, number one, um, and number two, we also, this is the Western Cape mm -hmm. um, Language Committee, they also um, done a costing exercise, and it costing exercise now for um, getting interpreters into different uh, facilities of the government. And it was really a fraction of the budget. Mm -hmm. But since 2003, nothing much happened. So yes, there's a great need for interpreters, but money is always a problem. Okay. Maybe I should just add, in South Africa, of course, we sit, sit with 11 official languages. That itself tells you, yes, we need this intercultural communication and we need interpreters. In the Western Cape, we have three official languages, namely English, Afrikaans and Ishikosa. So, to uh, follow the policy of the Western Cape, the language policy, and to implement it, we need trained interpreters, but budget is always a problem. Your own first language is, is what? My first language is Afrikaans. Okay. Yes. And your second language? My second language is uh, English. Okay. Maybe I should just add also here that the course that I'm running here at the university may provision for English, Afrikaans and African languages. When it comes to the African languages, I buy in colleagues from the uh, African language department. 
So I do it in collaboration with uh, other colleagues in the faculty, of course. So you're training interpreters for many language combinations? Absolutely, okay. yes. And they do a, a joint theory course then, or how does that work? It's a joint theory course that we're mm -hmm. doing, and the theory is then, of course, being done via the medium of English. So the translation theory and the interpreting theory is for all the language combinations, and thereafter the students go to the individual lecturer, of course. Okay. But what also helps, of course, the uh, variety of languages in the interpreting practicals is that you can make use or expose the students to relay interpreting. Before, okay, yeah. Uh, we're fortunate enough here at the back of my, you'll see the interpreting booths, of course. So, if uh, uh, the discussion is taking place in one language, this side, the one booth will put it into one language, A, and <clears throat> from there it will be relayed. <coughs> Excuse me. From there it will be relayed into two other languages. So it can be quite fun, number one, but also um, exposing the students, the trainees, to relay interpreting. Good. So, how about yourself? When you were 22, 23 or so, what were you doing? Yeah, 22, 23 did, at that you, did you want to go into interpreting at that, at that age? To be quite honest, after completing my BA degree, I wasn't too sure what I wanted to do. Oh. I trained myself as a teacher, secondary teacher, but you know, entering the secondary school or high school, I immediately realized this is not for me. I'll have to work myself out of this. Mm -hmm. So I registered at that time for a postgraduate diploma in translation and interpreting at uh, UNISA, University of South Africa. Two years later, I was offered a position at uh, also university uh, in the Western Cape. Um, so I only had teaching at the high school for three years. Okay. You were saved. Exactly, I was <laughs> saved. Um, after completing that, I completed or registered for a master's in translation studies at this university. Mm -hmm. um, then four years later, I graduated, of course, with this translation uh, uh, degree and enroll again for a PhD in community translation. Part of the dissertation that I've done in community translation, I also touch in one uh, chapter on community interpreting. Mm -hmm. but what, now, what do you mean by community translation? Yeah, you know, it's like the same, my promoter also asked me that same question a couple of years ago. Community translation, exactly, would you like to explain to me what you had in mind? Um, you know, if you look at the population of the country, um, some are literate, some are Ill, uh, illiterate, um, some have a school leaving certificate of, uh, say, grade seven. So it's impossible for them to understand a learned text. You know, you want to make information available to people. But it can merely be a symbolic gesture mm. if you just give the text in a learned corpus again in the African language to the person. So the aim of community translation is to make that text, number one, accessible to the person who's reading the text. And that means in some instances you as a translator need to explain Mm -hmm. You need to do some adaptations to guarantee effective communication at the end of the day. So that the person who's reading the target text, he or she will understand exactly what is being said. Even though the translator has explained some of the terminology that was said in the original source language text. So how does that relate to what we understand as community interpreting? It sounds a little different. It sounds you're absolutely yeah. right. It yeah. sounds a little bit different. Um, community interpreting, once again, it's also interpreting done within the community. Can be community in the clinic, can be during voter education. Mm. But if you characterize that community for the 
services being delivered to a very large extent they also have a low education level because that's why they need the interpreter to make it accessible once again to them. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, it's different, but I think there's also an overlap between community translation and community interpreting. So you then became a professional interpreter or how did that happen? Yes, after completing my PhD, um, I left the university for a couple of years. Um, went into the corporate sector as a professional translator. Mm -hmm. Three years later, I was offered again a position at my previous university in the linguistics department. Mm -hmm. At that time, point in time, I wanted to settle. But I was headhunted again by the current university um, to come over this side. But how I ended up as an interpreter is also a very interesting. I just got a call one day from National Parliament. The guy started off by saying something like, Dr. Lish, you are a translator. I said, yes, I am. Wouldn't you like to come and interpret for us? I said, no, 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 no. I'm not an interpreter, I'm a translator. But after you convinced me, I must just give it a go. Of course, the first session was, according to my standard, it was not up to scratch. But I think the third and the fourth session, it just went better. Had you had training? No, I didn't have any training. So it's possible to do it without training? Don't, yeah. don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, the, on the other hand, there's some people, uh, you can be trained as an interpreter, and some people are born sort of natural interpreters. Um, what I also say is that quite a few of the interpreters is a connection with playing one or other musical instrument. Mm. You know, doing more than one thing at the same time, reading the notes for instance and, and playing the piano, mm. like splitting your attention. Um, I have a little bit of music background. Maybe that counted in my favor that I can read the notes and play the piano. So they say men can't multitask, but I show them different. So that's why. So you I were then interpreting in the South African Parliament? Yes. Okay. I was a freelancer in the mm -hmm. national parliament for quite some time four years, I think. Um, and being a full-time lecturer also. Fortunately, my colleagues and my seniors do realize that you can't just be teaching the students, you know, the theoretical stuff as an interpreter. You must expose yourself also, or keep yourself interpreting fit, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, so I was given the opportunity to also interpret in national parliament. At the same time, or thereafter, the Western Cape Legislature or the Provincial Parliament also contacted me and I also freelance for them for mm -hmm. a year or so. But then all of a sudden my work became too much at uh, 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 the university and it's impossible to drive in to the city say three times a week. And in the meantime I got the course running at the university but... This course here? No. Exactly. Yes, okay. But there was also the need for interpreting services on our campus. Hmm. Okay. The campus is primarily an Afrikaans-speaking community. But in some instances, we need to interpret from Afrikaans into English. You can imagine, for instance, in certain faculty board meetings, in Senate meetings, etc. Um, and then the university and the faculty invested once again in buying a portable or portable interpreting sets for us. And with this interpreting, portable interpreting set, we could deliver a service on campus. And up till today, I'm still involved okay. on, you know, in interpreting service on campus. So I played a seminal role in 
you know, establishing the course and the service on the campus. Good. Tell me a little bit about research. Um, what, what research do you think could help the cause of uh, multilingualism in South Africa or the need for interpreters? What sort of research would have to be done, do you think, in this context? Yeah, when it comes to research, there was one project running of mine that is um, healthcare interpreting, where uh, we did a survey of what's going on in the three major hospitals in Cape Town. Um, three hospitals, it's uh, the one, it's uh, Groteskir Hospital that's linked to the University of Cape Town. Then there's Tigerberg Hospital linked to the University of Stellenbosch and Red Cross, Cross Children's Hospital linked to both this university and to the University of Cape Town. The, in the survey, for instance, we discovered that the interpreters at Groteskir Hospital, there were five untrained interpreters. It were porters that they just sort of sent through a crash course. The one at Tigerberg Hospital was actually a nursing auxiliary. She didn't have any knowledge. She wasn't 100% sure of what she must do. Um, and the third group was two interpreters at Red Cross. They were quite professionally soft speaking, um, quite literate. Um, they could relay the message of the doctor to the patient quite clearly and accurately. So, yes, the focus is on healthcare interpreting in my survey, in my research, but also the profession, you know, the professional behavior of the interpreter. Then there's another one running at the moment, and that is, let's call it educational interpreting, where we set up an experiment where the interpreter is interpreted during the lecture of the lecturer, of course. Um, as I've said earlier on, this is primarily an Afrikaans university, but there's English-speaking students also. So to assist them, this project was launched last year, and the initial uh, results that's coming out from this project shows, yes, it is possible to, to, to make use of educational interpreters. A third one that it's also more a very short um, initial uh, survey regarding the training of these interpreters, but the internships. You know, um, you know, if you send them into the field, um, exactly how does that link with, say, community interaction? It's a service you want to deliver to the community. But at the same time, the student also wants to better his interpreting, interpreting skills. So I think that is the main three... Are you looking at the effect of the internship or in the third project? What it's, were you looking at? Business? It's the effect, but also the whole ethics concerning okay. you know, this, 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 uh, the performance. Um, During the internship? During the Good. internship, yes. you're absolutely right. Okay. Um, just to add once again, you know, one is usually thinking when you're looking for um, venues where students, where you can place your students mm -hmm. for the internship. And I was fortunate to get the university hospital, Stellenbosch Hospital, just close by where my students can do interpreting as part of the internship. You know, when she wrote up her report, and I read the report, I was shocked. Shocked in the sense that this lady was confronted with death. I said, oh my goodness, this is something I'd never th thought of. But yes, you train your interpreters to be emotional strong. Of course, it's also a question mark. How you train somebody to be emotional strong, right? Yeah. And here she's confronted with uh, this incident. The same applies with ethics. How do you really teach ethics? You telling them the whole time you mustn't go and tell the people outside the meeting what's happening. Is that enough? 